Good morning. Oh, you all are you all are awesome. Hey, it is so good to be back. If you are new, my name is Cal. I'm the lead pastor here, and uh, been that for a while. I'm my uh, 24th year of doing that, and I just got to tell you, man. Every summer when I get away and I get to come back uh, and see you, it is just a gift and a joy. Um, so uh, good to see you. I want to. I want to say also, by the way, I just got to ask, I'm curious, how many of you attended the Leadership Summit? Make some noise if you were here. Coming back and getting to go to the Leadership Summit is just icing on the cake for me. And uh, it's just been a great week and a great weekend. So anyway, so good to have you here. Um, I want to just explain a little bit very quickly uh, why I do what I do. About 20 some year, 23 years ago or whatever it was, um, the board of our church basically just kind of set this thing up where they said, look, we want to keep two things healthy. We want to keep our church healthy, and we want to keep you healthy. And uh, so every summer, we want you to take some time and go make sure you calibrate all the dials, uh, get the gauges right. And so we're going to give you time. So Lisa and I we always take our vacation, and then it um, uh, gives us a chance. We travel. We sometimes speak at churches and different conferences and stuff, uh, get around to different churches. We just get a chance to get away. And, uh, and then we, uh, we get to come back. And coming back is always, always, always uh, the highlight. But one of the ways it keeps our church healthy is uh, we don't want a church that is too dependent on the, the lead pastor. And so what we do is we uh, put other staff in the pulpit. And this summer, uh, you, got to hear from, you got to hear from four campus pastors, two of our youth pastors, our senior executive pastor, which by the way, uh, Paul, if you can remember this, I think it was three weeks ago, he was talking about how he was on the uh, ropes course at Hume Lake and his wife and his daughter were encouraging him to jump. And he was talking about being a martyr and how hard it was. You remember all this? Um, it brought back memories for me. And by the way, I went to church here online uh, through the summer. So I heard these messages. And uh, I, I remember uh, like 25 years ago, uh, when I was leaving the youth ministry of this church, becoming a lead pastor, we went to Vegas. A bunch of our youth staff just had a ball. But um, I bungee jumped uh, at the Circa Circus. And had a, have no, I have no issue with heights. It was fun. So I came back and I said to Paul, well, you got to do this. He was on my youth staff at the time. And, and so we go, we go to Vegas and we, we get up on the tower. And if you've ever been on this tower, and I haven't done it for a long time, so I don't know. But it, you know, there's a swimming pool way down there. It looks like a little you know, teacup uh, you know, from the height. But um, again, I don't, this doesn't bother me. And so, but Paul is just absolutely petrified. And I got to tell you what happened because I, I wish I had the video of this. So they're hooking him in. And if you've ever done that, you know, you get all lashed in. And, and, uh, and the guy is messing with the carabiner and he like gets a wrench and he starts hitting the carabiner. And Paul is just like, this one, Paul's, off. And, and the guy goes, you know, okay, I'm pretty sure we got it. Go ahead. <laughs> and, and Paul, like a puppy dog looking at me, like, don't make me do this. But I didn't make him do it. But, but we always said this, Paul never bungee jumped. Paul bungee fell. <laughs> because he literally just had to fall off. And there was no jump and nothing cool about it. But anyway, uh, and then last week, you got to hear Mike Samino. And Mike Samino uh, is just a, uh, just a great, great guy. Uh, head of the Maricopa County Probation Department. Again, uh, has like 1,200 people who answer to him. Uh, but he's been a longtime leader in our church. He has served on our executive board. He served on the council here in Gilbert. And uh, he has um, uh, worked with the community groups. He's done all kinds of things. So anyway, uh, just to get to hear him uh, was just an absolute treat. And so anyway, it's just good to be back. So I welcome all of you. I welcome those of you who are on any of our campuses. I welcome those of you who are watching or hearing this online. Uh, it is just good to be together, and uh, I'm glad that we, we are. Now, I want to spend just a moment, I want to recap the summer, I want to make sure you got out of the summer what you were supposed to get out of the summer, and that is, we, we called the summer series 11.1. We had been studying through the book of Hebrews, and then we set aside the 11th chapter. The 11th chapter is called the Hall of Fame of Faith. It's the story of extraordinary things that ordinary people did for God, and, and it's an absolutely remarkable chapter. Um, it it tells a story of people like you and me who are, are nothing special per se, but that if you couple who you are with the element of faith and you put your trust in God, then God puts you on an adventure that'll be the lifetime, the joy of your lifetime. And uh, there are people who say yes and there are people who say no, but you have to understand that faith is what makes the difference. 
And uh, too many of us want to uh, sit on the sidelines and, and watch people do things. And too many of us want to sit in the stands and get the benefit of actually being in the game. But faith says you can't do that. You have to get out there. So I, I'm going to just put the verse up that all summer long uh, was showing up. And I hope you've said this verse over and over and over again. We did it. We've said it out loud. We'll close that series by saying this one more time. So Hebrews 11.1. 1. Let's say it out loud together. Now confidence. Now faith is confidence. Okay, we're going to start over because we can do better. I can do better. I can put the words in the right order, and I think that would be helpful. Can I get an amen from anybody? All right, here we go. Let's try it again. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. See, God has made us sure everything depends on faith, and if you have faith, you have everything. If you have no faith, you get really nothing. And, and, and then uh, just, uh, and I introduced the series uh, at the beginning of the summer with Hebrews 11.1, 1, but I also added Hebrews 11.6, although we didn't highlight this all summer. Why is faith so crucial? Well, look at Hebrews 11.6, it'll come up. Uh, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You cannot do it. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. See, faith requires an all-in commitment. No sidelines, no you know, watching from the stands. It's not about what you know about God, it's about what you do with what you know. And faith means you get in there and you do something. So that was the emphasis all summer. Now, set all that aside for just a moment. One of the questions that I get asked when I come back, and I've been bombarded with this question, uh, what did you do all summer? I I'm not going to take you on, I'm not going to show you a bunch of movies and slides and don't worry, okay? But there are a couple of things that I do want to point out that made this summer very, very special, okay? And uh, again, I'm just going to uh, ask you to allow me, indulge me for just a few moments. Uh, what, the highlight of my summer, to be real honest with you, uh, was the fact that Lisa and I celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary. Now, I need to tell you, I need to tell you something. Lisa's my first wife. She's my only wife. We have never broken up. And uh, we dated for years before we got married. And I'm telling you, this woman is the most incredible gift God's ever given me. She's the wind beneath my wings. And um, the truth of the matter is, is that God gave her to me to help me become who he wanted me to become and gave me to her to help her. And here's how I always described it to people. Uh, I, I tended to, when I, we, throughout my lifetime, I've had really sharp edges. She's really worked hard to help kind of round those off and make me a, a little bit softer in the right ways. And she's been uh, needing some sharp edges. And throughout her lifetime, I've been putting sharp edges on her life, and she would go, she's better. So it's just been a gift, and the years have flown by. We got to celebrate that. Well, where would where, you go? We went to Scotland, which is the second highlight I want to just tell you about. Uh, I've never been to Scotland. We had never been to Scotland. We always talked about going to Scotland. Scotland is absolutely beautiful. Now, we spent time in England, and then we went up to Scotland and uh, spent about 10 days just running around Scotland. But uh, we always wanted to go there. Uh, the highlands, the lowlands, it's so beautiful and so remarkable. And so we uh, set aside the time to get there, and we, we, we had this fascination with uh, castles. Uh, but I would say castles in our mind, uh, meaning we'd never really been to any castles in uh, Scotland, so we did, made a tour to go see a bunch of castles. I have all kinds of pictures. I will not bore you with them, but there's a, I actually showed four Thursday night, and then the team said, you really don't need to show. They're all just old castles, so I'll just show you two. Uh, this is uh, the castle on Loch Ness. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Loch Ness monster, Loch means lake, so Loch Ness is the Ness Lake. And uh, this is where Nellie, the Loch Ness monster, is famed to live. Uh, I got some pictures of her, but I'll skip those. Anyway, um, <coughs> that was one. And then this other castle, and again, these just are castles. These castles are remarkable. This is, uh, this is the castle where Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, grew up as a girl. And uh, uh, just beautiful, remarkable, like five-story tall buildings. Uh, just preserved through time. And, and, then, and then one of the highlights of going to Scotland was I'm a huge uh, Braveheart fan. Is anybody going to get an amen? Yeah. amen? Oh, man. Where have I gone wrong, church? Where? Uh, is there any Braveheart fans in the crowd? Thank you. Thank you. So I was very interested in, in uh, going and seeing places uh, that had uh, that history. Um, I discovered to all of us Braveheart fans that there's very little truth in the movie Braveheart. I was very disillusioned by that. But anyway, um, but there is something I, I just thought was remarkable 
um, uh, outside of Stirling, uh, uh, Scotland, the, the city of Stirling, uh, there's a castle, Stirling Castle, which is actually in the movie Braveheart. But there is a monument to William Wallace. And this monument is just a massive, like, four-story tall tower uh, that you have to climb up. And, and uh, my, I taught my wife into climbing up the hill that the tower was built on. And then you get to the monument, and you have, like, 246 steps to go up to the top. And she said no. And so <laughs> I went up to the top by myself. But on the second or third floor... I came off the steps and they have these little rooms of museums and I found something that just absolutely was remarkable to me. Uh, they have there the sword of William Wallace and this is the actual sword. And if you know the movie, you know the sword is like huge. But anyway, this sword blew my mind. This sword is taller than I am. And I, I was by myself because my wife didn't want to do the, um, and I had no way to put it in perspective. I was just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, but one other thing I want to tell you about Scotland that I, uh, it just is important, uh, and then I'll move on to the third and the final thing I want to say about the summer, uh, is that we uh, rented a car. We had never done this before in any foreign country. We rented a car in Edinburgh, and, and uh, we got it at the airport, and we had to drive to downtown. And, and you first get in the car, and if you don't know anything about this, everything's wrong. and They do it all wrong. Uh, the car is uh, going down the wrong side of the road, and the steering wheel's on the wrong side of the car. And I'm just telling you, it was a trip, and make our way down trying not to get killed, and there's all these uh, uh, um, roundabouts everywhere, and my wife, uh, she's advising me, you know. <laughs> See, the biggest miracle is we drove all over Scotland, and we're still married. And you got to understand, there were times I would say to her, Lisa, you're stressing me out. And she'd say, and you're stressing me out. And I said, you have no idea how hard it is to be on this side of the car. And she'd say, you have no idea how hard it is to be on this side of the car. And we're still married. So, hey, this God is good. But as we were driving around Scotland, there were a number of signs. I just saw one that I just have to show you because I don't know why this, this sign just absolutely made me laugh. I don't know. It won't seem funny to you probably, but I mean, I cried laughing when I saw this sign right here. This is a true sign. If you can't read it, it says red squirrels for three and one quarter miles. <laughs> Exclamation part, warning, warning, red squirrels. Not three and a half miles, not three miles, three and a quarter miles. And I, I just, in my mind, I'm like going, how big are these squirrels? Like, and if it's also funny, if you look at the bottom of that sign, there's actually a little squirrel somebody tied on there. That didn't seem overly threatening. I, one of my other favorite movies is Princess Bride. And if you've ever seen Princess Bride, that's filmed in England and not just a little bit uh, north is Scotland. And, and all I could picture were these rodents of unusual size. That's all I could picture, but I never saw one. So I was incredibly disappointed. All right. The third thing that was a highlight of the uh, summer, uh, study leave, was the study part of the leave. And uh, I, I gotta tell you, the coolest thing that happens for me is when I get the summer to read, I don't have to write sermons. That's what you need to understand. That's the break for me. I'm still involved in the church. I'm still leading in things, but I don't have to preach every weekend. And, and uh, so I can just absorb and absorb. And here's what I wanna tell you. Uh, of, the, of the thousands of pages that I read this summer, um, uh, there was one book that I want to highlight, I want to tell you about. I don't expect you to go out and buy it and read it, but this one book, my wife recommended this book to me a while back, and I just hadn't had a chance to read it. And uh, she happens to be friends with both the authors of this book, Alan Hirsch and Mark Nelson. She knows them personally, and uh, she said, you should read this book. She and some of her friends had read it, and, uh, uh, and so I took time to read it. it it's, the book's name is Reformation. It's obviously a play off the word reformation, but reformation, did that, that picture come up, the pop up, do you see it? Um, reformation uh, is the idea of looking at the church through a different lens, through a different frame. I, this book was so good to me, I read it, and then as soon as I finished, literally as soon as I finished, I started back at page one and reread it again. I highlighted more in this book than I highlight in most books, and uh, it was really, really good. Now, I'm going to return to that book in a bit, but I do want you to understand that that book caused me to do some deep thinking, and, and some of what I'm going to talk about today is from that book, and I want to credit the authors for this. It's not original with me. It's with them, and they just got me thinking about some stuff. But last week, Mike Semino said something that got me thinking, and uh, I want to remind you of what he said. He asked you a simple question. He said this question, what are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? 
Now, I don't know what you think of when you hear that, but most of us would say, well, the, the, the first right answer would be God. I'm passionate about God. And a lot of us would say we're passionate about God. The second right answer would be I'm passionate about my family. And folks, I'm passionate about God and I'm passionate about my family and my wife, my kids, my grandkids, all of that. But, but that doesn't make me different than anybody else. I want to push this harder with you and ask you, what are you uniquely passionate about? What, what are you passionate about that you don't see everybody else being passionate about? So, so let me put two other questions to you that play off of that. What keeps you up at night? What wakes you up in the middle of the night? And it's on your mind. You are thinking about it. You're processing it. You're, you're pondering it. You can't escape it because it's something that matters to you. And maybe not a whole lot of other people are up at the same hour thinking about the same thing, but you are. And then the other question I would ask is what causes you to daydream uh, that you could be an, an influence over? You could affect change. You could make it better. You could improve it. You could make it different. What is it that, like, if you've been around Center for a while, we have a phrase, we call it the holy discontent. What's your holy, H-O-L-Y, discontent? It's the thing you look at and say, somebody should do something about that, but nobody else seems to be discontent. They're just okay with it, but you're not. It was taken from the old Popeye, you know, I, I've had all I can stands and I can stands no more. What is it that you can stands no more that motivates you to get involved, that motivates you to think, that motivates you to wake up, that motivates you to come up with a solution to that problem? In other words, what I'm asking you is what do you truly, really, honestly come on to the gut of who you are care about? What is it? Well, I've had time to think about that. I've had a summer to process that. And uh, these might sound like cliche answers, but I promise you this is the answer for me. There are two things that I would say I'm truly passionate about. Number one is Jesus. And I know it sounds like a church answer, but I'm telling you, I am passionate about Jesus. I care about how Jesus is perceived, and I care how he is received. I really care. Uh, his honor, his reputation, what people think of him based on us matters to me. And the second thing that I am passionate about, and I wake up in the middle, is, is the church. I am passionate about Jesus, and I am passionate about the church. I care about how she is perceived and how she is received. And I think about her honor, and I think about her reputation. And I need you to understand, these are not just like other things in my life. There's lots of things I'm interested in. And I mean, I could literally go down the list. I, 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 I'm interested in hunting, and I'm interested in fishing, and I love boating, and I love archery, and I love motorcycles. I love traveling. I love friends. I love working with finances. I love all that stuff. But I'm not passionate about any of those things as I am passionate about Jesus and the church. Now, more passionate, truthfully, uh, you know, uh, my family's up there. I don't, I don't want to imply, okay? But I got to tell you, these things keep me up at night. Now, let me say something. Jesus and the church are not the same thing. Now, here's what I need you to understand. Jesus is fine, okay? Jesus is fine. There's nothing I need to wake up in the middle of the night. And I got to talk to Jesus about that because he needs to quit doing that. You know, I need to help him. Jesus needs none of my help. Jesus is fine. Uh, people who get to know Jesus, love Jesus, his reputation, his honor, on his part is fine. How we represent him is a different story, which brings us to the church. And the church, I can't tell you I am as comfortable with. Um, but before I even share what I want to share, I, I want to remind you of something, because I think this is really, really important. I love the church. I truly love the church. I, I've been in the church ever since I became a believer in Jesus. I had no intention of doing what I do in the church. That was kind of God's idea but I love, the, I love the dream of the church. I am, it's going to sound kind of weird, I am enchanted by the vision of what the church is and what it's supposed to be. I really, truly am. It captivated me a long time ago and it's held me captive. I, I love how when Jesus founded the church, he, he asked Simon Peter in a place called Caesarea Philippi in northern Israel, up, up by, by, the, by the fount of the uh, Jordan River, this beautiful spot, and he said, who do people say that I am? And they were different answers. But Peter, who always gets it wrong, got it right. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That's who you are, Jesus. And Christ said, Peter, you got it right. And on that rock, I'm going to build my church. The church is built on Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And I've never gotten that out of my heart. And then I think about the early church. 
the early days after Jesus ascended to the Father in the book of Acts, it talks about, it talks about the, the gathering, this thing that I've become enchanted with. And in Acts chapter 2, let me read to you just how it described this movement that was starting. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It was so unbelievably countercultural that people wanted in. I want what they're having. I want that. I want to experience that. In the the verse just before that I just read, let me show you what it said. Peter preached a sermon. Let me show you the response. This is Acts 2.41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That's 3,000. They only counted the men. It's not counting the women. It's not counting the children. That's not how they counted back then. This thing started as a megachurch. This was a movement, and people said, I want in. Why did they want in? Because they discovered something they hadn't found anywhere else. And I contend to this very day that the church is unlike any other institution on the planet which is why I'm enchanted with it. In fact, let me just walk you through a couple things to think about. Where else are you going to find a place where it does not matter what your social status is? You can be rich, you can be poor, you can be in the middle. You can have nothing, you can have everything, and you're welcome here. That's the church. This is a place where no matter what color your skin is, it doesn't matter if you're white or black or brown or red or yellow or whatever. If you're invisible, we see you here like you're never seen anywhere else. Where else are you going to find that? This is a place where your age doesn't matter. For those of you who are young, you, that's why the students, we cherish you. And if you're old, we cherish you. And we don't put emphasis on one and forget about the other because it doesn't matter if you're old or you're young or you're somewhere in between. This is a place where you're welcome. I, This is a place where your politics really does not matter, and it won't matter. Uh, And what I'm saying about that is you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're a Libertarian. If you're left, you're right, you're middle. We don't care because none of that matters more than what this thing is all about because you're welcome here. I can just keep going. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter if you've had an addiction or you've given into alcoholism or drug abuse or fornication or homosexuality or lying or cheating or stealing, you're welcome here. Doesn't matter what your past is because it doesn't matter what your present is. Whatever you're currently struggling with, this is a place that will embrace you and help you. Folks, there's no place like this on earth except the church. And I'm enchanted by the idea. I believe with all my heart that the church is the hope of the world. But wouldn't it be incredible if it was more like what Jesus intended it to be? Wouldn't it be incredible if if, if we actually practiced some of the things he taught us, like it's more blessed to give than it is to receive? Wouldn't it be incredible if if this was a place where the last were truly treated as the first and the first last? When people understood and truly believed that God has power over death, And whenever news comes your way, we know who to turn to to ask for help. Or that whatever the problem is in your life, we're a place that believes in the miracles of God, the supernatural acts that only God can do. Wouldn't it be incredible if we practiced that a little bit more? Where people, whenever there was a problem in our community, we'd just come together and we would reason with the Holy Spirit to figure out what do we do. I've got to tell you, all of that just enchants me. But the way we're living... In the world we're living in, folks, disenchants me. I'm disenchanted with the church. Now, when I say that, don't take this personal. I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm just talking about, I'm just disenchanted a bit with the church. We, we have taken the reputation of Jesus. And we've taken the reputation of his church, the thing he started, the only thing he started, and we have sullied the reputation. We have tarnished his honor. This summer, I saw something that just sent a chill down my spine, and... Um, 
you know, we, we can talk about all the church scandals that have been going on, and we do talk about them, but you know what? It's taken to a whole nother level this summer and the spring when, uh, and I'm just going to call this out. Um, Hillsong, a fantastic, you know, uh, story of a church and its worldwide touch. There were some internal issues, which there inevitably will be, but here's what's different. Hillsong has had documentaries made by the secular world. Now, now please understand what I'm saying. This is what's different. Usually the church tells on the church. This is the world telling the story of the problems in the church, and they're doing it on Hulu, which means any and everybody, when they get, they go, oh, see, see there, see there, see, that's the church. There you go. And the reputation and the honor go down. And, and then another one was on Netflix. I probably have these backwards, but anyway, net, no, I don't. Uh, Shiny Happy People. Shiny Happy People is a documentary on the family of the Duggars. And the Duggars were those who, that man and woman had like 14 kids, you know, like 12 and counting, 13 and counting, 14. And that went on for a number of years. And they were tied into Bill Gothard, who used to have Bill Gothard's Basic Youth Institute, if you remember any of this in the past. And then all of it just went crumbling down when it was discovered to be incredibly I'm going to use the word corrupt. It was not what it appeared to be. And they were not who they appeared to be. But so many people have been drawn in. And now Hulu or Netflix, whichever one, they made a whole documentary about it. And now everyone in the world can see into the problems. And everyone goes, yeah, see, that's for the church. And if that were all there were, that would be bad enough. But it's not all there is because there's all kinds of other scandals that we have to hear about and do, deal with. And I got to tell you, I'm talking about national level scandals, and I'm not going to name names, but if I did, you'd go, hey, I heard about that, I heard about that, that pastor, that. See, it's usually the leader that causes the fall, and, and then the, the whole institution just goes up in flames, and, and I could tell you about national names that you'd recognize, and then I could tell you about local names that you'd recognize, and every single time that happens, well, these are, listen to me, these are friends of mine, okay, these are people I know and I run with, these are friends of mine, and I ache for the pain in their life, but I ache more for the pain that their life caused the rest of us in the church, having to deal with the dishonor and the disreputation of Jesus in the church. And I would love to say that's not, never happened here, not on our watch, but it did happen on our watch. Last February, I had to stand in front of you. New here, I have to tell you bad news. We had an associate preaching pastor who we discovered had been involved in an illicit relationship for the past six months. And I told you it rocked us. I met with the board, and the board very quickly made a decision. What we need to do is we need to release him. And the decision was made. And then I stood in the church the following weekend, and I told you the story. And I got to tell you, it's interesting. I didn't quite expect some of it because there were people who left our church for two reasons. One, they were totally disillusioned that he could do that, and I get that one. But the second one was they were disillusioned with the fact that we let him go. And they say, hey, I thought you guys were about grace and forgiveness. We are about grace and forgiveness. But here's what I need you to understand. There were people in our church who expected us to, we will forgive, but we're not going to act like we don't know what happened. And we're not going to continue to subject other, other staff or other people to somebody who we know has this in their past. And they left our church because they felt like we were too harsh. They took issue with our board. They took issue with me. And I just need you to understand, I've lost a ton of sleep over all of that. So I'm a little disenchanted with the values that we're holding as we say we're following Jesus. Totally disheartening, folks. See, the beautiful story of the church has been defiled and sullied. And again, I don't specifically mean this church. I just mean the church. This incredible thing. I want to read to you what... Um, Walter Brueggemann, who is an Old Testament scholar, he said this, the gospel is a truth widely held, but a truth greatly reduced. It's a truth that has been flattened, trivialized, and rendered inane. You know who did that? We did that. Not Jesus. And here's what I just got to point. Jesus gave us one job. We had one job we we're supposed to do. One job. And if you don't know what that one job is, let me just share it with you. It's from the end of his, it's just the last words he said in the Gospel of Matthew. 
The one job, this is what he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. One job. And by the way, one job, one method. How are we going to accomplish that, Jesus? Let me tell you how. And he did. And this is what he said. John 13, 34, and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, that's the standard. So you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you're one of mine. That's how you're going to accomplish the one job I gave you. One job, one method. And we would love to say, church, we love to believe. We've done it. We've done it. Check that box, man. We love one another. Except here's the problem. Nobody outside the church is saying the church is loving. Can I say that again? No one outside the church is accusing the church of being loving. Now, that's not our reputation. Our reputation is quite different. Man, we're perceived as being extremely unloving, bad-tempered, combatant. We're condescending. More often than not, we're seen as truly hateful people. We've become known for what we're against, not what we're for, we become extremely politically oriented. We become extremely polarized. And the world looks on and says, really? So really what's happening is the people are not pushing away Jesus. They're pushing away from the church. Because the church isn't a whole lot like Jesus anymore. Matthew seven sixteen said, you'll know them by their fruit. And the church is ex- it's just perfectly tuned to deliver the results we're now experiencing. So, now... Hold on, that's not the end of the story. But I do want to take you somewhere right now. I want to show you something. I I don't know what, I'm going to change subjects, but it's got a point. Stay with me. I don't know what got into my wife. I don't know who got to her. But somebody started influencing her in a really bad way this summer. I don't know who it was. I have some suspicions. But she got turned on to tofu. Now, folks, I don't know if you know what tofu is. I, I can gladly tell you up until this summer, I did not know. I was ignorantly bliss, blissful. But someone messed with her and got her to try tofu, and for some God only knows reason, she decided she likes it. So she decided that I needed to like it, and so she started slipping tofu in stuff she'd feed me. And I'm spitting this stuff out going, what is this? And she says, it's good for you. And I'm going, no. So basically, I'm having this experience, this existential crisis in my life. And I read in this book an illustration, that, the Reformation book, that I just went, well, that, and that interesting. So they talk in that book about tofu. And I'm going, I'm all ears. And they explain what tofu is which is mashed soybean curd. <laughs> Doesn't that sound enticing? So basically, they, uh, they well, let me, it's just easier to show you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> this is tofu right here. It looks good. It looks like a little piece of cheese, but oh no. Oh no, that's for the uninitiated. No, this, I, the best way I can describe this, and by the way, the best way you can describe tofu, this is true. I'm not making this, it's a sponge. Chew on a sponge, you'll come out ahead, trust me. So this little sponge here, what it does is it just takes the flavor of anything surrounding it and sucks it in and kind of disguises itself as something good and you don't know the difference until you've actually put it in your mouth Mm -mm. excuse me Who would ever do that to themselves? I'm going to be spitting tofu now. Sorry. Oh, that is horrible. Absolutely horrible. Oh, gosh, give me a moment. 
See, here's the problem, okay? The church has become like tofu. What do you mean, pastor? Yeah, we're just kind of sucking in all the stuff around us, taking on its flavor, and we become so bland we become so not our own entity, not our own influence, not our own effect. We're just, you know, absorbing a little of this, a little of this. And, and by the way, we want to make sure we don't offend anyone, so let's keep it really bland. Let's not say anything offensive. Let's not say anything that would upset anybody. And the church has become like tofu. Now, in that book, they contrast tofu to something else that I had never experienced until this summer. Warhead candy. Warhead candy. I had never had a warhead, but I had a suspicion of what I was going to experience. On Thursday night, I put a warhead in my mouth for the first time. So I've had tofu this summer for the first time and warhead for the first time. Now, let me tell you the difference here. Tofu is easy to eat. This is hard to open. No, the difference is this little thing right here. If tofu is bland and just... Ugh, this is, it gives you the exact opposite. I discovered this Thursday night. <laughs> I'm alive. I mean, this is anything. This is like my whole head is exploding right now. Oh, this is incredible. I mean, this is a kick in your teeth. I mean, this, wow. Oh, oh. You know what's interesting about this? You want to do one of two things. You want to lay back and just embrace it and enjoy it. Or you want to spit it out. Listen to me. That's exactly what they did to Jesus. You hear the Jesus story who really is? You're going to come alive. It's going to come in color. You're going to be vibrant. You're going to go, the coolest thing ever. Or you're going to spit them out. But you're never going to say that about tofu. You're just going to go, Bleh. <laughs> just get rid of it. Folks, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny here, but I need you to understand. Let me just kind of close this out by saying, I, I've been in... Us, enchanted by the vision of the church, the hope of the world, the answer, the thing that Jesus started. And then I've become disenchanted by watching, as many of you have, I know that. But this was not what it was meant to be. But here's what I've been praying about all summer. And as I go into the last chapter of my leadership journey, uh, as a pastor, God, help me to become re-enchanted. Help me lead a congregation to become re-enchanted with this incredible story. Help me to come back to a warhead kind of experience with you and to help people to discover that. What would, uh, what would it look like if you became re-enchanted? What, what would it look like if you decided that you, instead of being timid and quiet and bland, you would be bold and outspoken about your faith? What would it look like? What if you took the kingdom values and you said, I'm going to live those out regardless of whatever price I pay in this world because this world is passing away. What if you lived as though you really did believe in miracles, as if you really did believe that the power of God is unlimited? What would it look like for you? What would it look like if you would be willing to sacrifice anything temporary for that which is eternal? You sacrifice anything that's not going to last for something that would last. What would it look like? And that's been my prayer. You know, our mission as a church has not changed. And sometimes people come back, hey, tell us the fall. Tell us what we're going to do. Tell us all the new stuff. And I'm going, hey, man, the vision's the vision, man. The mission's the mission. That didn't change because I went on vacation. What's the mission of our church? To lead people to discover and fully own faith in Jesus. The same has been for years. That is mission one. What would it look like, folks? Now, I'm so out of time, I don't have time to go into. Let me just share with you why I'm becoming re-enchanted. Number one, I'm being re-enchanted because 
I, we've already planned out the year, and this is going to be a fantastic year. I don't have time to walk you through all the details. I will as I can. But next week, we're going to begin a series called Chosen, in which I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart, we're going to make the biggest impact on the world as a church we've ever made. When you get done with that, we're going to do another series. I'm going to take you through the certain sermons through the book of Acts, and I think we're going to make a, an impact on Phoenix, like we have never as a church made an impact on Phoenix. Uh, you go, Cal, that sounds kind of big. Yeah. And I want to tell you, I think if you're tired of doing life alone, we got more community lined up for you. And by the way, at the summit, and I don't remember the exact number, 53%, I think, of all Americans said they're lonely, and 70% of all leaders said they're lonely. Why? Because we're choosing not to do life together. We got all kinds of stuff that's ch going to challenge you to do life together. All of that is coming, and so much more. I'm excited for us as a church right now, folks. It's going to be cool, but let me finish. Let me close. I want to read you a passage. I want you to hear this. It comes from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider, church, you, me, let us, us, the church, consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Folks, I'm going to begin the series in the book of Acts by telling you, I believe the day is approaching like it's never approached before. The day of Christ, the day of the return. I think we're closer than we've ever been. And by simple numbers we are, but reality, I think it's coming sooner than you might have thought. And the church, such a time as this, for such a time as this, great time to be re-enchanted. Will you join me in this journey? Now, I'm going to put three questions up on the screen, and I'm going to walk off the stage. I'm going to ask you to stare at those three questions, process them, and then a statement is going to come up on the screen. Please read that sentence and process what it means. This is going to be quiet in here. And then the band's going to come out, and they'll do that here, and they'll do that where you are, and the band's going to come out, and we're going to talk about the mission of the church. So read these questions, please. 